Thank you, Petra. Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks to this uh, renowned institution. Um, it's my first time uh, to present a lecture at, uh, um, at an institution like Artist. Um, I'm a literary scholar by training, um, but with a huge interest in cinema and Russian cinema in particular. Um, so I hope I can uh, enlighten you a little on the most revolutionary stage uh, in the development of uh, Russian cinema, uh, which happened to coincide with the political revolution that took place in 1917. Um, funny thing is, uh, perhaps outside of Russia there is more attention for the Russian revolution now than there is in Russia, because the authorities have a very contradictory uh, attitude towards the events of 1917. Um, it's not really, I mean, there are still some hardcore communists who, you know, get together and celebrate the centenary of the October Revolution, but the authorities and President Putin himself, you know, really don't know how to, um, to respond to this centenary. Um, there's a lot of interest in it from historians. Uh, but it doesn't seem appropriate to actually celebrate the centenary. Um, and still, society is struggling with the question of whether you know, this was a, a, a terrible mistake, a dramatic experiment that, that went dramatically wrong, or, or is it something else? Um, at least the, people, the, the way in which people respond to it now is far more contradictory, far, far more controversial than it would have been, say, 30 years ago, before the break of the Soviet Union. Okay, um, I'll start with um, what went before the uh, revolution, the revolution of 1917, um, and the revolution in uh, cinema in particular. Um, I'll take a little bit on the pre-revolutionary uh, art of cinema in Russia. Um, first of all, because it's a personal favor. Um, <coughs> you know, some 20 years ago, people didn't even know there was a booming film industry in Russia before the revolution. Everybody is aware of the contribution of Russian filmmakers to world cinema starting in the 1920s. Uh, but that, that there was a very original and authentic Russian cinema, even before the revolution, something that was completely unknown um, some 20 years ago, until people started to rediscover and restore you know, these old nitrate pre-revolutionary films. So I want to tell you a little bit about, uh, um, about that, so that you can uh, appreciate you know, the innovations that were then introduced by uh, a number of directors uh, Lev Kuleshov, in the first place, was a great admirer of American film. Um, then we'll switch to Sergei Eisenstein, probably the, the greatest, or one of the greatest Russian directors uh, ever, um, who was also influenced by these American, this American way of filmmaking, but then took things a step further by introducing the notion of intellectual montage. What that really is, something that uh, I'll try to explain. And then we move on to the late 1920s, to documentary filmmakers, like Ziga Vietov and Esfira Shuk, uh, who did not believe in the concept of feature film. They were more interested in documentary film, in ways of relaying contemporary experience, but not using traditional art forms. And then we get to the early 1930s, that's where I'll stop, when socialist realism became the one and only obligatory approach, method, to do art. Um, so my main focus will be on the 1920s, because that is what Russian or Soviet cinema is still uh, mostly remembered for. I hope the equipment won't let me down or that 
Um, I won't let me doubt myself. <laughs> um, but I think I can I can get the uh, the clip started. So uh, let's let's keep our fingers crossed. Okay, just a few slides on Russian cinema before 1917. Um, what is interesting? What is interesting about Russian film is that it was very much, at least initially, influenced by the tradition of Russian classical literature. Um, the realist uh, novels, baggy monsters as they are usually called, these thick, uh, huge novels of 19th century prose writers. Um, whether you like it or not, these uh, pioneers in film were very much influenced by uh, that particular tradition. Um, so, it took a while before Russian filmmakers discovered that art is a completely different art form um, and that, you know, different laws apply when you try to tell the story in film as compared to literature. Um, what is interesting is a Russian preference for tragic um, not necessarily only in Russia, that was a specific characteristic of most European films. Uh, they, sometimes they even came in uh, two different editions. One intended for the American market with a happy ending, and one with a tragic ending intended for the European market. But Russian filmmakers specifically favored the tragic endings. Um, if you look at these films from 1917, it's, it's almost as if you're looking not so much at a, at a, at a play in a the theatre, but the pace of it is so tremendously slow as compared to what we're used to now, that it seems that we're looking at a different art form, and this is not film uh, as we know it today. So, in terms of cinematography, that is, the way you use cameras, the way you edit the film. You know, things were very slow moving. And in terms of mise-en-scene, that is what you actually show on film, you know, the, the, the position of the actors, their movements, their props, um, that again was characterized by a preference for these you know, thoughtful pause, poses. You know, people would just stand and stare in the in the, in the fire, um, and as a viewer you were expected to kind of sympathize with that and understand that the character in question was going through uh, a serious psychological crisis. Now what happened with the start of the Second World War is that um, on the one hand Russian cinema um, plunged into a crisis, in the sense that there was very little import of raw film stock. So there was an enormous deficit of equipment, of film stock, to produce films. At the same time, no foreign films were imported. So, for three, four years, Russian cinema developed in relative isolation, and succeeded in developing a very specific own style. And I want just to give you an impression of that, I want to um, show you a clip from the film um, by Yakov Protasanov, uh, one of the main directors before the revolution, who um, then emigrated but was asked to come back after the revolution and succeeded in pursuing a successful career, um, coming back from emigration. Um, and this is a, a film based on a, a story by Lev Tolstoy, Father Sergius. Um, I'm not going to give you the, um, you know, the, the storyline. Just pay attention to the camera movements or the lack of movements, and look at what is happening in front of the camera. This is a great example of what is known as precision staging. So it's a very long shot with uh, numerous characters moving in and out in front of the camera, um, forming different choreographies, as it were. And in this way, 
the film manages to tell a very interesting story. But it completely runs counter to our notion of cinema, which is mostly based on editing and montage. So, let's see. So this is supposedly Jean Nicolas I visiting a boarding school of a prestigious military academy. So this is more or less where it starts. This is, this is the beginning of a very long show. Okay, so that is an example of precision staging and completely um, you know, still camera work. No editing involved whatsoever. Okay, um, just very quickly, the highlights, the political highlights of the revolutionary year 1917. You probably know that there were actually two revolutions, one in February um, with the Tsar abdicating and a provisional government taking over. Um, in October, or rather uh, in November, that's a different story, November the 7th, uh, Lenin's Bolsheviks, the Bolshevik party, took over from the uh, provisional government. Uh, they arrested the ministers uh, you know, and proclaimed the uh, first socialist republic. Obviously, not everybody was happy with that, so what ensued was a civil war that lasted for uh, three years. And since cinema is a very expensive art form, you know, that cannot do without large investments, um, this had a detrimental effect on film production. Um, you know, most people working in film at the time fled to the south, to Crimea, which was still in the hands of the, the white people who opposed the Bolsheviks, but then they were forced to leave. So directors, actors and actresses, people working in the industry fled to mostly France to continue their career, which in the time of silent cinema was still possible, of course. Um, and what happened in Russia was uh, a complete crisis, um, not only in the film industry, uh, because the whole country was uh, devastated, was... Uh, struck by this bloody civil war, uh, but as I said, this also had its effect on uh, the film industry. Um, what then happened in August 1919 is something that we associate with you know, a socialist government, that is to bring the industry, the film industry, under public control, to nationalize it. Um, again, this was an incentive for many people working in the street to uh, leave the country. Um, but at the same time, the new regime took film art very seriously. And this uh, manifested itself in the decision to open a state school for cinematogra cinematogra cinematography or cinematographic art in Moscow. 
which is still functioning today. So, uh, you know, all the major Russian directors um, have graduated from this uh, prestigious institution, the geek, as it is usually called. Then, Vladimir Lenin decided to stimulate the economy by allowing a limited form of entrepreneurship. Um, and this meant the, uh, that there was some cash flow, that there were new investments possible, and in the early 1920s, we see that film production is resumed, and that you know, the most revolutionary, most innovative directors in the 1920s were actually in a position to make their first films. Now, I started with a quote from uh, Vladimir Lenin, um, of all the arts for us, film is the most important. Does anyone have a clue why he decided that film was so important and not literature, given you know, its uh, traditional prestige? Why would he proclaim cinema to be the most important art form? Sorry? Illiteracy? That is, yes, that is the most, uh, most important argument. 60% um, of the population of this huge country was still illiterate. Um, so how to convey this revolutionary message, how to reach the masses, that you know, could be achieved most successfully by using film. Short films, short newsreels, with a clear proper propaganda message. Um, and of course, literature will, will, would have to wait a little. It was a massive campaign to fight illiteracy, and quite successful. But in the early 1920s, film was indeed you know, the most successful art form to actually connect to the, uh, to the masses. OK. Um, now let's zoom in on those revolutionary uh, filmmakers, people who were in general inclined to support the new regime or who were even very enthusiastic about this socialist experiment. The first man to, uh, to mention in this context is Lev Kuleshov. Um, you know, he was more known as a, a teacher, as a mentor. Uh, he died only in 1970, so he trained uh, an impressive number of, of, of directors. Um, and he, so to speak, was the bridge between Russian film or Russian art and American film, which at that time was already blossoming and, and uh, you know, over, overshadowing you know, most other national film industries. There was an article that I had asked you to read um, called Americanism. Americanism is a pejorative term, Amerikanshina in Russian, meaning that you know, it, it denotes something that you despise, that you, you know, that you don't really appreciate. But Kuleshov was of the opinion that the Americans were the better filmmakers and that most Russian directors still hadn't figured out that cinema was a very specific art form uh, and that it uh, had its own laws. So in his article he makes a number of programmatic statements um, which many people were offended by but eventually, you could say that Kuleshov's um, view of Russian cinema uh, and how it was lagging behind in comparison with American film, um, how he came out victorious, so to speak. Um, so foreign-made films are more popular than Russian ones. And this is an interesting observation because, um, you know, it's, it's uh, as true now as it was then. I mean, go to a Russian cinema, a cinema theater, now in Russia, and you'll see that you know, people flock to see American blockbusters, um, and 
Russian art films are not very popular. So um, this observation, you know, has, uh, is still relevant in a way. <coughs> but then he goes a step further and says, well, the best foreign films are American-made detective movies, right? And what is the, their formula of success? Their formula is their maximum degree of cinema specificity. What does he mean by that? The maximum amount of movement, primitive heroism, and an organic link with contemporary life. So I think we, we understand a maximum amount of movement. Um, Kulishov clearly wanted to break with the slow paced pre revolutionary film. Um, primitive heroism, that is also more or less understandable. But what is Cinema specificity. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, he then goes on to say, well, what is you know the basis of cinema, the organizational basis? What is the essence of cinema? What makes it different than literature that we are all familiar with? So it's not the really, um, we should not look within the confines of the film fragment, that is within the shot but we should look at the way in which these shots are combined, in, which, in the way in which they are edited. And that is called montage. Genuine cinema is a montage of American shots, and the essence of cinema is a method of achieving maximum effect is montage. So, you know, the, the clip that I showed you earlier by Protazanov, this terribly long take of over three minutes, I mean, that is clearly in contradiction with the essence of cinema as Kuleshov um, had defined it. And now I want to, um, I'll skip the, um, this specific um, clip and I'll move on to some other contributions that Kuleshov made to show you a far better movie that was released in 1924. Um, the Kuleshov, other than you know, promoting Americanism and the American approach to filmmaking, uh, is also known for the Kuleshov effect. Um, and that is a legend. Has it, is anyone familiar with the so called Kuleshov effect? Anyone? I see some people nodding, but not everybody is raising his hand, so I'll try to uh, uh, explain this rather quickly. Um, if you look at the, uh, at the illustration, then you see what the experiment was about. Uh, earlier I referred to the lack of raw film stock, which forced Kuleshov, in the difficult circumstances of the Russian Civil War, to experiment and work with already ex existing, um, existing uh, footage. So what he used was thank you, existing footage of a famous actor, Ivan Mazuchin, and he used that in a montage with different shots, one of a girl lying in a coffin, one of a uh, plate with soup, and then uh, of a beautiful lady. And the interesting thing is that the expression of the actor is rather neutral, and it's always the same close-up. But the experiment revealed that depending on the combination of the close-up and what the actor was looking at, the audience decided that you know, the, the, the main emotion of the actor was sadness, hunger, or lust. And this led Kuleshov to, to, to conclude that shots are like building blocks, and that you actually tell a story by combining uh, these building blocks. Uh, in this way, you actually tell a story, you uh, convey a certain message. So it's not the shot itself, but the way you combine it, the way you edit it. Um, I'm not going to. Um, now, but there is an interesting 
a demonstration of the Kuleshov effect by Alfred Hitchcock. So, um, you know, if you uh, look it up on YouTube, you can judge for yourself. Um, now, let me give you an example of a, of a film that Kuleshov made himself, uh, and that more or less um, was made in accordance with his, with his own uh, ideas. Mr. West's Incredible Adventures in the Land of the Bolsheviks. This is a comedy, a detective movie at the same time, full of movement, um, full of cinema specificity, if you will. If you will. Um, and I think it's, it's just very interesting to watch. Also because you see you know, images of Moscow before um, it was completely redone under Stalin in the 1930s. Um, but this is the, you know, a Russian attempt of making a, an American movie. So let's see. So it's about an American, an American coming to the land of the Bolsheviks, the young Soviet Union. And this American is full of prejudices and thinks there are all there are spies and communists all over the place. And slowly he discovers that you know people in Russia are honest and warm people. And this is uh, the American's bodyguard, a cowboy, who is chased by the uh, by the Russian police. 